Father, the only strength that we have to stand is the strength that's given to us by your Spirit, through your Son. Father, I thank you. We all thank you. We stand here in awe. We stand in praise. And Lord, we want to stand upon your word. And as we see what you have for us in it today, that we might live lives that are worthy of your calling. And on that last day, that we might stand before you. Hear those words we heard this morning. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We thank you for this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. In his biography, Just As I Am, Billy Graham tells a story that revealed a devastating feeling that he experienced because he missed something important, something that was irrecoverable. It was just after John F. Kennedy was elected, they had an event together and he rode with uh, President-elect Kennedy to his home. And on the way home, this is when he was still driving his own car, President Kennedy, uh, then president-elect, he stopped on the side of the road. And he turns to Billy Graham and he says, Billy, do you believe in the Lord's return? And Billy Graham said, I most certainly do. And he said, well, I don't, I don't know that our church teaches it. And he said, well, it's in the creeds. He said, yeah, but they don't preach it. I don't know anything about it. I want, you to, I want you to talk to me about it. So Billy Graham explained to him about how Christ came the first time and died on the cross and how that he will come again because he rose from the dead and, and how that only permanent peace will be something we can experience at that time. Kennedy said, that's, that's very interesting. We're going to have to talk more about that one day. He drove on, and then it was, uh, wasn't until a couple of years later, a few years later, that Billy Graham had another opportunity, sat with President Kennedy at the 1963 National Prayer Breakfast, and, and Graham spoke of uh, Damocles' sword as the metaphor, it was the, the sword, the unsheathed sword that was hanging only by a thread that could fall at any moment as he was referring to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Some of you may remember that, and that had ended only a little bit before. But Graham had the flu. He only spoke for uh, about six minutes. Kennedy spoke, and they went out to the car together, and... Kennedy, then president, said, Billy, would you ride back to the White House with me? And Graham said, he did the right thing. He said, listen, Mr. President, I have a fever. Not only, not only am I weak, I, I don't want to give you this thing. Could we wait and talk another time? It was a cold and snowy day, and Billy didn't have his overcoat, and he was freezing. The president said, of course, we can talk any time. But there wouldn't be another time, because as you know, President Kennedy was assassinated. Graham laments in his book his hesitation at the door, his request. They haunt me still. Should I have gone with him? It was an irrecoverable moment. Have you ever missed a moment? Has something with only one opportunity slid by you and you watched it go past? And you either could not 
would not or did not stop it. Perhaps the miss was perfectly understandable. I mean, after all, Graham did exactly the right thing. All of us came with our masks today. Would we not have done the same? There's no guilt-worthiness here, but nevertheless, the moment passed. But that feeling, when you feel like you've missed something, is one of the most dreadful feelings that you can experience. This sense of, of loss and, and pain. You know, I feel bad enough when I miss an appointment. <laughs> but what would I feel if I had believed, or if I believed that the Lord had come for his saints and I missed it? And I missed the moment. You know, the Thessalonians thought just that. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. There's a whole lot in this chapter. We're only going to go through verse 7. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being together with him, we ask you, brothers not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction uh, for those of you who use the King James, I love the way it's translated because it's a very direct translation. The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. He takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Now Paul had taught the Thessalonians all about the day of the Lord from the Old Testament. The day of the Lord, that time of coming judgment, where God will bring his wrath upon the people of the earth. And ultimately, of course, if you measure that entire uh, spectrum out, also a great many blessings. But for this part, what they thought they were experiencing was a direct and dramatic way of of persecution than they had ever experienced before. But the reality is, in that day, it will, in fact, objectively be greater. We know this from Isaiah and Zephaniah and many other places. And from other New Testament revelation, we discover that this occurs after the Lord comes for his people, his own, in what we know as the rapture. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul had taught them that the day of the Lord would come as a thief in the night. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.2. However, in today's text, in verses 1 and 2, we understand that many of them, perhaps even all, were under this spell that they had missed that. The day of the Lord was now here and they had missed Christ's return. The persecutions they were experiencing were no doubt horrible. The Thessalonians had been taught that they were experiencing these judgments as a part of the day of the Lord. And a uh, great many Christians believe this. And they believe this for many of the same reasons that the Thessalonians did. But if that were so, then how could Paul's previous teaching that they would be caught up with the Lord, they would escape the wrath of God coming to the earth, how could that possibly be true? 
Let's walk through this. In, in verse 1, Paul just jumps right into it. He, uh, he, right into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in order to straighten out the matter. The only thing I want to point out here is that in, uh, in the ESV that I read, it says, We ask you. That is not strong enough. Paul is not saying, you know, uh, Thessalonians, uh, we ask you. you know, he wasn't. It's closer to beg. It's the best translation is using a word which we don't use in English anymore. It's beseech. We, we beseech you. Ask is simply uh, too weak a phrase here. But Paul warns them and us against believing false teaching. So apparently the belief that they were currently suffering under uh, came to them through a series of prophecies. When it uses the word spirit, that's generally what that means. Somebody stood up, said they had a revelation from the Lord, and that was, we are now in the day of the Lord. And people said, okay, I, you know, maybe that's real. And then there were reports that other people were teaching this, and then apparently we find out in chapter 3, in verse 17, Apparently, someone had forged a letter or written a letter to the Thessalonians and claimed it, it claimed to be from the Apostle Paul. Paul says, it wasn't me. I didn't write that letter. So they were getting it from multiplied sources that they were now in the day of the Lord. They had to rethink their theology, but they were shaken. They were tore up inside that they had missed this. But if it were the day of the Lord, again, how could Paul speak of the Lord's return as preceding the day of the Lord? These two separate events. There are two things that are happening here. I mean, in 1 Thessalonians, in uh, ver chapter 1 and verse 10, he wrote this, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So you say, uh, okay, that's an interesting quote, John, but the verse 10 doesn't say anything about the day of the Lord. So how do you see that that is telling them that they hadn't missed it? Well, you're right. There's nothing in there about the day of the Lord. But for the last six months or so, we've been constructing a a very powerful argument as it relates to the day of the Lord. We learn that John was propelled in the book of Revelation to this day of the Lord. We learn that the opening of the seals and that the judgments to be experienced largely were spelled out in the book of Revelation. And that most of the book of Revelation, in fact, concerned itself with the day of the Lord. And we learn from the book of Daniel that the day of the Lord spoken of here is seven years in length. And at the three and a half year mark, there will be the abomination of desolation. We learn that when Antiochus Epiphanes slaughtered a pig on the altar, he was an example of who the Antichrist was and what the Antichrist would do. However... He was not the Antichrist, and that was not the abomination that makes desolate. And then we find out from Daniel and other places that it will be the man of sin, not a man of sin. He would be the Antichrist, not a Antichrist or an Antichrist. In other words, Paul taught that the Thessalonians had turned from idols to serve the true and living God, and to wait for his Son from heaven. This will even become more clear in just a moment. You know, from the earliest days of the church, the Christian community earnestly anticipated the return of the Lord. You have to understand that when something is that proximate, they saw him leave. In fact, when he, when he rose from the dead, the disciples asked what? Will you at this time establish your kingdom? No, that's not, that's not the time yet. But they all anticipated that Jesus Christ would come. 
James believed this in chapter 5. He says this, Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Peter also wrote, James, now you have Peter. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. The author of Hebrews, which we read from chapter 10 this morning, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more so as you see the day approaching. The firm persuasion that Christ could return at any time permeates the entirety of the New Testament. In fact, Paul himself thought that he might be among that company and when he said, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's in 1 Thessalonians. That's what these people were afraid they had missed. Finally, Paul made it clear that a watchful and a hopeful expectancy of the Lord's return is actually a godly virtue that he wants to instill in us. Where he says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Simply put, the New Testament is crystal clear in its anticipation that Christ's return could occur at any moment. We use the word his imminent return. So what does imminent mean? Does it mean soon? Well, it certainly has a, an element, a time element to it, a temporal element to it. Generally for us, when we use it, it means, it means short. But biblically, it doesn't mean short necessarily. What it means is nothing has to happen between now, or then, I should say, and now for the Lord to return. In other words, there are no prophecies that have to be fulfilled before the Lord can return. He can return at any moment because it makes no sense. Now hear me, this is the argument, and I hope it's beginning to solidify in your, in your mind. It makes no sense to say, wait on the Lord, when what you're really waiting for is the beginning of the day of the Lord, so that if your math is right, you'll know exactly when he's coming back. And all you've got to do, actually, is count the days from the abomination of desolation. As soon as that happens, we got it. No. No, no. No one knows the day or the hour. That is appointed by God. And he's not talking about the beginning of the day of the Lord. He's talking about his return for us. And Paul is not done with this either. Paul is going to go on, he's going to say a few more things about this so that these words would not ring hollow. I believe and have almost since I became a believer that there was nothing that needed to occur for the Lord to come back for his own. Because if there were something, then his return would not be imminent. And all the New Testament writers would be wrong. And I cannot and will not and do not believe that. It's inconsistent with the tenor of the entire New Testament. And then in verse 10, there's something else of that chapter, uh, that first chapter in verse 10, where it says to wait on the Lord, right? You, you're gonna, you've, you've been delivered from idols. You're serving God. You now wait on the Lord 
and because something else is going to happen. You will be delivered from the wrath to come. Now, a lot of believers, when you say uh, the wrath to come, what is God's wrath? They go, ooh, that's hell. That's what that is. Lake of fire. You know what? Okay. All right. No Jew would have thought that. Any Jew, anyone who knows the Old Testament, when they hear the wrath of God that is coming, they are not thinking about hell. They're not thinking about eternal punishment. The wrath of God they're thinking about is the day of the Lord. No one has thought that in that community or even in anyone who knows the New Testament since they've read Daniel for the first time. And you find out that what is happening is that the day of the Lord is going to come as a time of God's wrath. And yet the Apostle Paul says, you will not be subject to wrath. Uh, someone had taught these recent converts. They were still fairly new converts, the Thessalonians. They were saying something along the lines of, no, 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 no. That's not what's going to happen. Uh, you're actually going to experience the wrath of God. After all, I mean, really, seriously, do you think that you're so much better than your fellow man that God's going to pull you out of this? Give it a rest. You're not any better. God's not going to uh, take you out so that others can experience that. You know what? Somebody could make a powerful argument to such a, a thing. But no believer believes that. No believer believes that they are better than anyone else. In fact, what they do believe is that the wrath of God was buried in Jesus Christ on the cross. The wrath due to you and to me was the sword of God's wrath was plunged into Christ. We're not going to ever, listen to me, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you will never, ever, in any form, or fashion, or way, or means, or in any other way, experience the wrath of God, ever. Because if you say you do, that diminishes the work of Christ on the cross. And you have to pay a little bit extra. Jesus, it wasn't quite enough. i got to pay. That's not what the Bible says. But I tell you what. Troubles don't mean wrath. <laughs> These guys were going through some hard times. And so do we. But those hard times are not God's wrath. That's something that is different. Verse 3, they thought they had missed it, but how could they? I mean, they had set themselves apart. They had done everything that the Apostle Paul had asked. They had obeyed the truth. They had done everything that they could. They were being misled is what it was. And, uh, I mean, we can all be misled. If the personality is remarkable enough, if the words are smooth enough, if you're not anchored in the Word of God, you can be misled. We all can. The antidote to this poison that was introduced into their system was, of course, God's word. I mean, so, so Paul tells them a few things. He says there are three things that have to happen before the day of the Lord. Nothing has to happen before the Lord's return for us. What we call the rapture. The, it's, it's, a, it's a Greek word that means to be, to be drawn away quickly. And it, there are three things. First, the apostasy. Second, the revealing, and third, the removal. So one major event is this, this rebellion, it, the, the apostasy. Apostasy is the Greek word. So if you can say apostasy, you, can, you, know, you know another Greek word. And it means falling away. Uh, there's some sort of a revolt. 
There's some sort of rebellion inside the church, an abandoning of positions long held uh, dear. And, uh, you know, yeah, I know apostasy has been a part of the church since the church's beginning, but there's something about this that is going to be particularly distinct. It's going to be almost like a total, uh, a, a total overthrow uh, of, of the church, and it's going to be distinguishable. I mean, Paul wouldn't have mentioned if it wasn't. Another event here is that the, the day of the Lord occurs, that there is the revelation of the man of lawlessness. Now, the tense of that Paul is using here is that this revelation is going to actually be a revelation. In other words, everybody's going to go, ooh, that's him. There's something that's going to happen where they're going to know who this, uh, know who this guy is. And he's going to be a fully associated and characterized by lawlessness as the son of perdition. So it seems probable to me, and this is obviously, there are, who knows what will happen, but from the biblical evidence, it seems that he will be made manifest when he uh, breaks his covenant with Israel that he'll have made uh, at the, uh, or people who know when he makes the covenant, they'll know who he is. But at the three and a half year mark, everyone will know who he is. He'll be widely recognized. It, further, he is an anti, uh, he's an adversary of God. He's going to replace, in verse 4, he's going to replace, he's going to seek to replace the worship of the true God and have worship brought unto himself. He's going to proclaim, in fact, to be God. Now, all the early church fathers, you have to understand that until Constantine, everybody believed this was going to be a person. After Constantine, we run into some issues because they're going, wait a second, now, now government and the church and all this is like one big pot. We need to rethink our theology. And it was uh, up until the 1800s that people began to say, no, this is a real guy. This isn't a metaphor. This isn't some sort of a system. This is not some principle. This is a real person. And we've not seen anyone like him on the stage of human history. He hasn't come yet. So uh, this teaching was nothing new for the Thessalonians. I mean, Paul had taught them in, in, in verse 5. He says, I told you all this stuff before. And you know what's amazing to me? He wasn't with the Thessalonians very long. The Thessalonians were brand new. And he says to, he says to us in his word, I told you all this before. In other words, in other words, the Apostle Paul didn't think that prophetic truth was too deep or too complex or too anything else to keep from new believers. He shared it right with them. But then we come to a very interesting piece here in verse 6. The emphasis shifts to what is presently restraining the revelation of the man of sin. Paul said the Thessalonians knew who, knew who he was. You, you know this. You got this, right? But he didn't identify him here. So that leaves us, okay, so now we have to do a little sorting out to figure, uh, figure who this is. But something or someone is withholding, is restraining lawlessness. And uh, he says that there's even this secret power, that mysterion. This is the same word that's used of the gospel as it relates to the Gentiles. It's a mystery, something never before revealed, and that is this. A mystery, uh, in this case, is the revelation that there's going to be a future climax of lawlessness in the world. And we see that already in effect, we see lawlessness at work. I mean, all rebellion, uh, all rebellion against divine law is directed by, uh, aided and abetted by Satan. And it's been in operation since Adam and Eve. But lawlessness is actually being restrained. And it will continue to be restrained up until the time for the revealing of the man of sin. And that... 
The question we have is, okay, who or what's restraining this satanically empowered movement against God's law? Uh, many have said it was Rome. I mean, that's after all, the Apostle Paul says they, they don't bear the sword in vain, right? They don't, so Rome, but I, Rome's not on the scene, folks. That's, that, that has passed into uh, history. Uh, some say uh, it's uh, Satan. What? Why would Satan hold back sin? I mean, his native tongue. How do you know Satan is lying? Because he's speaking. Did, did you realize that's the import of what Jesus said? When, when he speaks, he lies. He's telling this to the Jewish leaders. You speak the language of your father. Our father's Abraham. No, he's not. That's just an amazing weight of, uh, uh, of this. Others suggest that it's human governments. Um, and, okay, you know, that goes along with Rome, but expanded to just government in, in general. But the thing is, government doesn't end when the Antichrist is revealed. This, the revealer, is going to be taken away. Right? The restrainer is going to be gone, and yet we find government still exists during the day of the Lord. Now, most of you already know this answer because we have 2,000 years of Christianity behind us. But the only person with the power and the will and the desire to restrain lawlessness today is, in fact, the Holy Spirit of God. And how does he do it? Well, I know at least one way. One way is that he indwells us as believers. Do you know in the Old Testament the Spirit would come and go, right? He would come and go. He'd be on somebody and then he would leave them. I mean, what a, what a devastating kind of a thought. But in the New Testament, in the New Testament, we are taught that when the Spirit of Christ comes into us, when the Holy Spirit indwells us, we are indwelt, period, full stop, end of sentence. He will never leave us, ever. So in some way, Christians, by living the Christian life in sufficient numbers or in sufficient places is restraining lawlessness. We have to ask this question then. How will he be taken out of the way? I mean, if the Spirit of Christ is taken in order that the son of perdition be revealed, think about this. The New Testament declares that our indwelling is permanent. And if the Spirit leaves so that He can be revealed, will we no longer be indwelled? No, of course not. When the Spirit leaves, we're going with Him. That's when Jesus comes back for us. And it's when we're gone, when the Spirit of gone, that this world that we think is crazy now is going to go insane. There will be no one to say, um, have you considered the moral implications of this? Boop! No. No. Paul is saying here, dear Thessalonians, I beseech you, you to understand this, you will not see the wrath of God. Bad things will happen in this world, but they're not God's wrath. Jesus made that clear when he spoke about the Tower of Siloam, when he said this, or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners or offenders than the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, they were not. They were just people. They were just in the wrong place when it fell. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, Billy Graham, 
he missed a unique opportunity, in large part, of course, because he was trying to protect the president. But it nevertheless bothered him the rest of his life. He wrote this book when he was in his 90s already. Brothers and sisters, some of you may feel like your chance, and some of you watching live stream, you may feel like your chance has passed you by. That even if you don't think you've missed the rapture, you may think that you've missed the final opportunity you have to be right with God. Let me tell you right now, if you can hear my voice, that day has not yet come. There is time. You have the opportunity today to make the most important decision of your life. Don't let it pass by. Don't miss it. In the movie Dead Poet Society, Robin Williams' character pleads with his young charges, Carpe diem, seize the day, make your life extraordinary. He asked the same question that Robert Herrick wrote when he said, Gather ye rosebuds while you may. Why did he say that? One of the students offered a, <laughs> offered a, hey, maybe they were just in a hurry. And William's character said, no, it's because one day you will stop breathing. One day your life will be over. Did you miss it? Did you miss the life you could have had? If you feel that way at all, Christ will give it to you. He even promises to restore the year of the locust. I love that. If only you will turn to him. Come to him today. Do not delay because the day is approaching. Father, we look forward to the day when you will come for us. We look forward to the day when we will be with you, when the trials of this life, even of the kind the Thessalonians were facing, will be over. And we will be with you forever in glory. And Lord, may we not misunderstand your grace we will not face your wrath but only your firm hand of love strengthen us encourage us with these words that the apostle Paul had given to the Thessalonians that they might live lives not of anxiety and stress and fear, but of power and of expectation and to give you glory. Through Christ our Lord, amen.